a really broad question. However, we do know that in Uganda, there was a lockdown related to prevention of COVID-19 in March uh, 2020, and many schools shut down, including um, primary, secondary, and university education schools. So children had to go home. And this created a lot of stress for them because A, they were not seeing their friends, but also because many of them were not in school. Uganda has a, a young population, more than 60% of our population is less than 18 years. So you can imagine nearly 17 million children and adolescents and young adults were at home. The government did provide some level of education for the majority of students, including um, having online classes and classes on the television, and also in the newspapers, but this wasn't accessible to many students. Um, some students continued to have school online, particularly those who are in private school, but those who are in the national schools, many of them were not accessing any educational classes. So this created some form of discomfort and even a lot of stress. So these were some of the challenges that were faced. One of the ripple effects of COVID-19 among children, even though children will not suffer a lot from COVID-19, um, like we have very few children with COVID-19 in our country, about 200 out of the 11,000 confirmed cases. But children do suffer from mental health problems. They suffer from anxiety by seeing many cases, their parents are ill, they don't know what's going to happen to them, but also suffering from frank depression. We've had situations where children have actually committed suicide just because they are not getting the correct mental health support that they need. And children suffer because they are no longer seeing their friends because of the restrictions and the lockdowns. Children are supposed to be happy, children are supposed to be playing with their friends and meeting up with their friends. But because of these restrictions, uh, sadly, they are getting into um, many mental health challenges that also need to be detected and treated. And another side effect is um, obesity. And we know how obesity can result in other non-communicable diseases, including um, cardiac problems. So it's important that we think about the non-COVID related challenges that these children are facing um, just because they are children. All children are vulnerable to sexual abuse, to physical abuse. As children live with their parents in very close contact, we realize that some of the children were being physically abused. But also we had uh, sporadic cases of sexual abuse. There was one particular case that every single person in the country got overwhelmed with, a mother who was um, selling her daughter for, for money. Like she indulged her daughter in, in sexual activity and she was being paid. And the community reported her to the police. She was apprehended. The men involved were also apprehended and the girl was rescued by the Ministry of Gender and the police. But also we've had um, situations where girls have become pregnant, underage girls. And although the figures are not very clear, we've got statistics from the police, from the judiciary, that more and more girls are being sexually molested and defiled. And we've had an increasing number of pregnancies. Even just this morning, I saw an um, adolescent girl in on our ward who presented with, um, came in with her baby who was quite ill. And this was a 16 year old girl who has now dropped out of school. And she's at the level of, uh, I'd say S3, which is about grade um, 11. So we are seeing increasing number of pregnancies and a lot of, sexual molestation. That's another thing that the Ministry of Education is, is, is supporting.
that for girls who have become pregnant during this lockdown, they should be allowed to go back to school because educating a girl child empowers her and cuts, uh, cuts down on the cycle of poverty and vulnerability. When the lockdown happened, it's only essential workers who are allowed to travel freely and also some you know, ambulances, essential workers, etc. So the majority of the population was not allowed to travel. So when children felt sick, actually, and that's another problem, they, they had to be moved through an ambulance service or get permission from the resident district commissioner to be able to access healthcare. And that was also another challenge. So it depended on how best the municipal uh, council or the city council was able to address the emergency situations or the Ministry of Health. But as you know, ambulance services are not very av available. So mm -hmm. there were challenges of access to healthcare in some situations. So schools are not fully open. About two weeks ago, school was open for candidate classes. That is uh, primary seven. So joining, you know, the end of primary class, so primary school, and then senior four and senior six. And then the university students are also at school now, but they are doing blended learning. The Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Health had to ensure that standard operating procedures were in place before the students were accepted into the schools. That meant that there was spacing, that um, the staff had been trained on, on social distancing, uh, hand washing, uh, inclusion of hand sanitizers, wearing of masks before the schools were reopened. For the most part, most of these schools have now opened for the candidate classes, but the non-candidate class uh, students are still at home. I, I do know that many parents have, those who can afford, have transitioned their students from the national syllabus to the international syllabus where online classes are continuously happening. Um, but those in national school still continue to learn from television, radio, newspaper, pullouts. They do have websites where homework is placed and the students are doing their own, own learning, like student-led learning. Not every family has access to the internet, let alone a television or even a radio. So for those students who don't have access to these uh, media learning opportunities, I think they're just not at school. Children with disabilities, may not have the opportunity to continue learning because they need um, specialized learning skills, which are not being availed at this time. Some, um, some people have gone on to try and um, adapt the curriculum using Braille, but that's just for um, students who have visual problems. And the Braille is not availed in the newspaper pullouts. So it becomes a challenge for those children with disabilities. And then for the displaced children, and as you know, Uganda is one of those countries that has a huge population of refugees, close to a million refugees. So many children who are with their refugee parents are not having proper access to to learning at this point, because they may not have access to a television or newspaper pullouts or, or internet. And that, that's also a challenge.
the Ministry of Gender and Social Services has um, shared an, uh, an phone line where children can call and it's an emergency number that is easily accessible. And that number is 116. So any child who feels they're in trouble can call that number and they can actually um, be supported or helped. I guess the big challenge is the access to a phone or the follow-up of you know, the complaint. And we've seen situations which have been reported where you know, mothers have had challenges of their children being defiled and the entire blockage in the judiciary system is, is quite frustrating for, for the complainants. So there's a huge backlog that has even been reported by the Chief Justice himself. So when a child has been defiled, I guess, for me, it's the emotional and psychological challenges that this particular child faces, but also the care that they need immediately. And then the person who victimizes this child should, should be put to book and arrested and, you know, go through the court system. So for me, it's the holistic care of a particular child who gets abused that is the missing gap, that they need psychosocial attention, that they need psychosocial care. And if it happens that the person who is taking care of this particular child is the abuser, then that child becomes even more vulnerable, that the person who's taking care of them is the abuser, they are taken away, the child is left hanging, they, they have no further support. So the social services need to be beefed up. First of all, yes, we should be engaged in research. And I was saying that at Makere University, we have a grant from our government. It's under the Research and Innovation Fund that is looking at key issues that have not only happened during the COVID period, but also post COVID. And this research grant is also mainly looking at uh, the sustainable development goals and the National Development Plan for our country. As a research team, we've been able to access money from this research and innovation fund that looked at um, causes of early pregnancy, comparing the urban and the rural population. We've also um, started a study for the COVID period, which is affecting children, on how children were accessing healthcare in the community hospitals, even during the COVID period. So as researchers, if we do not do research and, and ask those pertinent questions, then we cannot inform policy. In addition, researchers need to promote um, good clinical practice, but also support our Ministry of Health in, and the Ministry of Education in providing good policy evidence-based practice so that our policies are, um, are strong when we develop them, but also when we implement them, that they are implementable. 